Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Lauren Meeker. Welcome back to Beyond the Production, Opera San Antonio's live interview series, taking artists off the stage and into the community to share their experiences in the operatic arts. I am uh, Opera San Antonio's general and artistic director, and joining me, as always, is my fabulous partner in crime, Francesco Miliotto, our music director. Hi, Laura. <laughs> Hi, Francesco, how are you today? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful, awesome. sunny day in Chicago, so We're I'm great and happy. Oh, I love it. We're a little bit overcast here today, but happy, nevertheless, always to be back here. Mm -hmm. So I want to first and foremost give a shout out to everybody who is watching today, and thank mm -hmm. you for joining us live or uh, for watching the interview later on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. All of the interviews from this Beyond the Production series can be found on our YouTube channel under the playlist Beyond the Production. Mm -hmm. We have two fabulous, wonderful guests joining us today. Uh, first up is our wonderful stage manager and COVID health and safety coordinator, Dustin Z. West. Mm -hmm. And later on, we will be joined by Rick Frederick, who is the director of resident company and community engagement at the Tobin Center. Now, the Tobin Center is our main stage home, and we will return to the stage with Opera San Antonio this spring in a semi-staged 90-minute concert version of Lucia de Lammermoor on May 6th and 8th. So the goal of today uh, is to give you lots of great information on that production uh, during today's interview. But without further delay, why don't I go ahead and add our first guest, Dustin Z. West, in. Hi, Hi everyone. Dustin. Hey, Dustin. Hi, how how's it going? Doing? Pretty Excellent. good. How are you? How are you? I'm Fabulous. great. It's a bright, sunny day here in New York as well. All right. Fabulous. I love that these interviews, we always have artists from all over the place and we get to sort of ping across the United States. It's really pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Love it. So Dustin, um, you know, we met each other a long time ago in, in, in Santa Fe and we're, we're going to discuss that later for sure. But please tell, I mean, usually people don't think of, you know, you say of oh, the artists and what was your first artistic experience and what got you into the art? But as a stage manager, I mean, I don't even know how many times do you get that question? Do you get that question a lot where someone says, what inspired you to, to the arts and to do this part of the arts? Were you doing something else before and you sort of transitioned into this position? Or is this something that always, uh, you know, that always attracted you to the arts being, being on this part of it, not necessarily on the stage? So what was your first experience? What brought you to it? And how did you get to where you are? Yeah, so I think as a kid, uh, I went to Starlight Theater in Kansas City, which is this beautiful outdoor theater, mm -hmm. and they do a summer musical series. Um, and I want to say that that's sort of the first place where I saw some live theater performance and was exposed to the sort of grandness of this art form, uh, both in musical theater, but also I think in opera. Um, and mm -hmm. sort of from there, I asked my parents if I could do take ballet classes. Mm -hmm. um, and music lessons. I played violin and piano growing up as well and sort of got into that realm. Um, it's good to know we can use you as school. a sub just in case we need someone in the violin section. I <laughs> don't remember how to play, so I don't think you want that. <laughs> no, but it was good. It uh, gave me this like base knowledge of what I do now, which is musicality and performance. Uh, and a real understanding of what is happening with the people that I'm working with and uh, allows me to see sort of the big picture, which I think is one of my strengths as a stage manager is to understand how a production is intended to go and what, what all the parts and pieces are of that. So from um, playing and piano and, together. So from playing piano and violin and getting in and seeing all of that, is there something that like, what sort of pulled the curtain back from for you that was like, Oh, look at those people back there. How can I be one of those people? Totally. I think I was always intrigued by the design of productions and how uh, um, scenic designers and costume designers, right, could create this entire world around a production. And it felt good to like live in that world as a performer. Mm -hmm. um, and so that sort of started a, a 
transition for me into like how how do those things happen? Who are the people working behind the scenes? Um, how does a production get researched and and all those things? So I got really I sort of nerded out about all of those aspects, mm -hmm. and in selecting a place to go to university, I uh, chose a really small liberal arts college that would allow me to sort of put my hand in lots of different things. Mm -hmm. My my core focus at that point obviously was still in like a, a dance background. I wanted to, to be in a chorus on a, of a Broadway show. Okay, so um, can I interrupt Dustin? Cause I wanna know more about um, that performance aspect. What I feel happens so much, you know, before we go into when you start to transition after college and beyond, you know, so many of us have such different backgrounds that get into uh, opera in general, let alone going from performance to uh, behind the table, as we say. So can you tell us a little bit more about your career dancing or with the instruments that you were playing and how you fell in love with those aspects? Sure, I think uh, with most performers, it's a sort of love affair with the audience. Um, and so as a ballet dancer, like that, the moment of being on stage and feeling that connection, there's like a tension and a pull between the performer and the audience. And I really enjoyed that aspect so thoroughly. Mm. Um, and that's sort of what motivated me to keep going mm -hmm. um, through all of that. And so it was a combination of, right, during the school year, I was very intensely in, in ballet and other dance disciplines. And then in the summers, I would do community theater. Um, so as a kid, I got to, to play some, some child roles, uh, doing productions of Mame and Bye Bye Birdie, uh, things along cool. that line. And uh, yeah, sort of kept my toes in, in both, both parts of it. Um, it. Yeah. So did you pursue uh, dance or ballet more specifically all the way up into college? Was that really where your, your focus was at that time? I did, but I, I I wanted to start shifting at that point into more musical theater. So I was seeking out uh, opportunities for professional summer stock and, and things of that nature sort of early in my collegiate career. And uh, sort of unfortunately, I had a, a slip on some, some ice in my sophomore year of undergrad and got injured. And at that moment, right, you have the awakening that, oh, this isn't forever which is always sort of there for a dancer, right? That the, the lifespan is, is short. You hope that it can go as long as it can. Mm -hmm. um, but at that point is when I really started to evaluate, okay, what are the other things I'm interested in in, this, uh, in the performing arts? And how can I start my transition now uh, to sort of set me up in another part of this industry? So this was you uh, sophomore year of college or sophomore year of high school? Sophomore year of college. Ah, so at okay. that point I had already done some performing things. Mm -hmm. um, sort of in the summer between freshman and sophomore year and in sophomore year when I got injured, it was like, okay, so what can I do this summer? How do I keep going? Uh, mm -hmm. And fortunately at that exact moment, I was going to a festival uh, for college theater programs and the Santa Fe Opera was there and was conducting interviews for technical positions. So I it was like, great, sounds good. I'm gonna put in for whatever I can. Um, mm -hmm. And I went through the interview process and uh, got a position on their orchestra services committee, which is like the base level, get in the door and, and yes, learn about how mm -hmm. opera works, uh, which is something I hadn't touched at all up to so that point. So when you graduated from college, uh, tell us again what college you went to and what your degree was in. Yeah, so I went to William Woods University, which is in Fulton, Missouri, mid middle of Missouri. And it uh, my degree is in theater and communications. Ah, okay. So wow. how does something like Santa Fe Opera, which you know we've had guests like Matthew Ozawa on before who mm -hmm. have also been through that kind of program, but how do you go from uh, where you were at the end of college to suddenly opera and an institution like Santa Fe being on your radar? How did that even come up for you? Yeah, so my apprenticeship, like I said, was in the sort of production and music services department. And at the end of my college, there was a position open in that department for a new supervisor to come in. Um, and I had loved my first summer there. And so I put in for that and was hired to come back. And I did that for the next six uh, seasons with them. So from 2011 to 2017 or 16. I, I don't think everybody knows how, how Santa Fe works. Can you, I mean, it's, it's a very special place and the place where young artist programs 
were invented and also, you know, it, it's a different way of working. Can you explain a little bit of the model? I know you said like coming in down at the bottom, but there's, you know, as we both, as everybody knows here, there's a special way that that, that sort of tree works. So can you explain a little bit about that on the technical side? Because I'm, I'm so used to being on the opposite side of that. I've, you know, Absolutely. So they have a pretty robust uh, technical apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. So uh, college students from all over the, the country and, and even some international apply for, I think there are maybe 200 positions for technical apprentices, mm -hmm. right? And these are the people who are working as stitchers in the costume shop during the day, but they're also dressers for the wardrobe team at night, or they're hair and makeup artists, or they're constructing in the scene shop. Uh, doing painting, making props, running the shows uh, mm -hmm. from a backstage perspective. So, for example, the stage crew, they primarily work overnights. They're mm -hmm. changing one set out for another because the, the company plays in a rep schedule. And so mm -hmm. you may rehearse uh, Traviata on stage during the day, and that night it's Tosca, which is the performance. Um, right. So it takes a lot of people to move all those parts around and, and make that happen. And so it's a really great base level exposure to five large opera productions for those people. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of them continue on in, in the opera field, but also in other aspects of performing arts. And so during this apprenticeship, do you have a specific area of study or focus, or do you get to play within many different technical aspects of opera? Sure, so regarding the main stage season, everyone has their specific focus. But for the end of the season, they do two apprentice scenes concerts with the young artist apprentice singers. And at that moment, the technicians are invited to apply to work in other departments. Ah. So for me, that was applying to be a production assistant in the stage management department and getting to sort of experience what it's like to be on the side of the stage, queuing singers entrances and uh, doing prop and costume paperwork, sort of tracking those items and, and what, what are the sort of base skills for an assistant stage manager on the deck. Um, okay, so let's sort of, talk about yeah. that just a little bit more, Dustin, because um, I'm intimately familiar with what a stage manager does or an assistant stage manager, but I think a lot of the world does not understand what that position is. And not only doesn't understand it, doesn't understand how critical it is to the success of any major production. You know, I, I love, I'm very hard on stage managers, but I love them because they keep the world going around. So if you were to sort of big picture, capture what it is that a stage management team does, can you help describe that for our audience today? Sure, so they are the primary conduit of communication for a production, they're the hub. Um, so if the director has information that they want passed on to a designer or to the person who's building a certain prop or a costume piece, they're going to pass that information along as well. Um, similarly, uh, from the, the singers to any administrative, they, they may have some crossover there. If someone from marketing wants to do an interview with someone, a lot of that comes through stage management. So it's constantly taking information in, assessing its importance and where it needs to be redirected to so that everyone else is informed. Um, that's sort of what I see as one of the primary focuses. And then in terms of the production specifically, it's understanding, like I mentioned before, all the parts and pieces and how they fit together and also working to assemble that puzzle sort of for the first time with that specific group of, of artists who are creating it and, and figuring out the safest and uh, most consistent ways for everyone to do their jobs backstage. And I will say that it, it sounds almost quote unquote easy when I hear you talk about that. Like I think like, oh, he's just this little hub of communication that lines go in and out of. But in reality, the amount of documentation and paperwork and uh, internal materials that your team creates to keep the show going is quite extraordinary. Dustin, can you just give us a, a quick rundown of the kind of work that your team puts together to literally allow the show to happen throughout the rehearsal and performance process? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so from a pre-production standpoint, before rehearsals start, it's a lot of liaising with the director and the rest of the creative team to see where they are in their process. Because up to that point, I've not received any information typically. 
um, and sort of looking ahead to where there, where might there be an issue um, and how best to organize that information from a, a standpoint of this is where we want to start, even if that's not the final product we put on stage. Um, so doing as much preparation as possible, which typically for a production is uh, between one to two weeks of, of time spent in an office and sort of going through all of this stuff with a fine tooth comb. Then once we're into rehearsal, you're recording changes to all of that on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, all is sort of continuing to look forward to the fact that you're not going to have a lot of time to work with maybe the run crew who are actually handling set pieces or costumes backstage. And so all of the information that I might have in my head needs to be clearly documented in the briefest manner possible so that they can come in at the last minute uh, and do their job quickly and effectively without much question as to what's needed there. So it's a lot of, it's, it's passing, again, passing on that information between people. And it's, it is, as you said, so crucial. Yeah. I mean, for me, the, I mean, I, I know all of these things that you do before that I, I never see, I, I absolutely appreciate them when I get to the room, but for me, the, the thing that I think is the most, the most impressive and the part where you guys, you know, stage managers are the boss of everything and everyone, the book that you have, the score that you use with the millions of colored tabs and things to do in it is a hundred times what I would ever have marked when I first started conducting into a score. Like your scores are, it's just the, it's literally the production, every aspect yep. of it everything and but i mean please explain a little bit more about how you mark that because it's all about timing and all about calling things and doing everything like everything from telling people when to come out of their dressing rooms in time for them to make it to like everything is controlled by stage management and that microphone and that book and that book becomes then the recorded bible of that production that can be passed on to other people to do it right i, I don't know Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No. And, and that book, it, it's, it is the essential part of my job. It's usually twice the, uh, the, the size of the score because we've often inserted pages in between each page mm -hmm. to take notes on. Um, a lot of stage managers use different systems, but anything from stickers to post-its to colored pen, uh, to sort of mark everything out. Uh, I know a lot of people that use, they'll do uh, purple for props and they'll put scenery in green and they'll sort of mark everything out that way. Mm -hmm. um, it tracks all of the singer entrances and exits, which uh, for people who might not know in opera, different from in sort of theater or, or dance, the stage management team cues most of the singer's entrances and, and sort of tells them, this is your moment to go on stage. And that sort of stems from a fact that the singers learn a lot of rep uh, material and they may not know the entire opera, especially if it's their first time doing a, a Tosca, they, they don't know the whole piece and it's in a foreign language. And so I have a, a physical score there and can, can sort of guide them. Now is your moment to go on stage. What they do from there is, is their responsibility. Um, but so everything up to that moment is sort of uh, crafted for them to, to make their job as, as easy as possible. But so, thank you, so Josh, with Dennis. Dennis, who I think he might know a really extraordinary stage manager as well, uh, other than you, Dustin, is saying, uh, thank goodness for stage managers, which I love. Um, uh, Veronica, who's our artistic administrator, <laughs> who is an there organizational nut. Yes, the two of you uh, can probably uh, learn lots from each other. And Rhonda, who used to be with us, she's now over in uh, Austin Opera, says the amount of detail work is mind blowing. Um, I also just want to layer in that uh, part of what makes that work that you're talking about so brilliant, Dustin, is the fact that opera is a huge machine, right? So uh, let's think back a year ago before COVID happened, oftentimes, especially in big houses, you're seeing productions where there are a hundred some odd people on stage. There's uh, an equally impressive number in the pit and behind the scenes as well. And it's not uh, often that in the opera industry, 
any one group of people has a phenomenally huge amount of rehearsal time. Opera is so complicated and so expensive that we actually end up on one of the most truncated um, rehearsal and performance schedules as compared to what you might find in theater or dance. So someone has to help keep everybody who, for lack of better terminology, is under-rehearsed, right? Um, who hasn't had the time to really understand the full scope of the show in their core. Someone has to help all of those folks literally get from point A to B all the way to Z through the end of an evening. And that's how I really think that the stage manager lives, he, they, that your whole team is responsible for saying, to any given individual on in the process, we got you, here's what you need to do, here's where you're headed, take the ball and run with it. I mean, it's like being the coach, basically, isn't it? In a lot of ways, yeah. And, and so there is also that aspect to it, right? Where you are both mother and motivator to the cast in a lot of ways. You've got to yeah. be their caretaker and make sure that their mental well-being is uh, checked in on and that they are, are <laughs> as prepared to be on stage. Uh, <laughs> Especially now, I think in, in the times of COVID and looking into the future as uh, stage managers, but also uh, in general, we're looking at ways to sort of make a, a healthier rehearsal process um, because people are not going to quite have the stamina coming back into this that they may have had before. Um, and sort of how do we how do we create healthier work practices yeah. uh, out of this? I think the health and safety, I mean, that's where the uh, our conversation is headed, but I want to speak to it specific to stage management and being in the room because for uh, anybody who's new to opera or anybody who's young and considering coming into opera, I quite find uh, the stage manager to be your first and best line of defense when it comes to health and safety, that the whole stage management team is really there uh, to be the, the voice that you can go to to say, hey, I need help with or hey, you know, can this or this or this become more safe? And you're, you're really the, the pinpoint, Dustin, on you know, uh, creative teams getting super excited and not thinking about you know, health and safety codes, or you know, art watching what artists are doing and also saying, hey, can we adjust this? Can we tweak this? This would keep the production more safe. That's a huge responsibility, but I think one that uh, really does fall on your shoulders, correct? Definitely. Uh Safety is always of highest priority. Um, it's just opera at the end of the day. It's not worth someone getting injured or, 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 or worse uh, for. And so we're constantly looking at ways to, to make what we do safer, uh, especially a lot of operas, dramatic operas involve people getting killed on stage in, in various ways. So, or, or fight scenes, uh, if there's dance involved, any of those things, there's a lot of physical safety aspects both to the onstage production, but then also the moment they hit the wings, it is dark. They're coming from a very brightly lit space often to a completely dark space. And so making sure that when they get off the stage that there are no trip hazards or that we can provide a flashlight, any sort of ways to make the backstage environment uh, safer as well. Mm -hmm. So now in the era of COVID, we're leveling up on what it means to be health and safety conscious for almost every aspect of a show. Mm -hmm. So Dustin, I know that the fortunate position that we're in here is that you did so much incredible work uh, at Santa Fe Opera uh, that also led you into working at the Glimmer Glass Festival. You mm -hmm. also were led here by our artistic advisor, Garnett Bruce to start stage managing at Opera San Antonio. Now all of a sudden we find ourselves in a new position where challenges that a year ago we couldn't even conceive of in terms of keeping people healthy and safe are now uh, dominating the conversation in order for arts organizations, in particular opera, to get back into live performance safely. So I wanted to uh, let everybody here uh, know that I've given you another task. You've stepped up in a, in a new health way uh, for Opera San Antonio, you know, several, several months ago as we were just uh, starting to put the puzzle pieces together here in San Antonio to be able to say, we want to go back into live performance. We want to do it as 
safely as we can for artists, for staff and for audience members, uh, I turned to Dustin and said, hey, would you become our COVID health and safety coordinator? Dustin, in a, in a bullety, bubbly kind of way, can you talk about what that element means and how that applies to live uh, and performing arts? Sure, so uh, over the course of last summer, but also into the fall, uh, the opera industry at large started to really evaluate how we could return to live performance with guidance from the various unions, um, as well as sort of the all of the different companies starting to share information about what are what are we planning to do and how do we think we can achieve this, um, what's possible and and what will be the safest way to bring everyone back together because again safety is the highest priority here. And so I was fortunate enough to be engaged to go do a production uh, similar to what we'll be doing with Lucia, although on a much smaller scale with Opera Grand Rapids um, and sort of go out and test the waters, see what it's like. We had six singers in that production and a 22 piece orchestra. So we're scaling up for Lucia down in San Antonio, which I'm excited about. Um, and really figuring out where are stumbling blocks here? What, what are the things that are going to sort of hinder the production and, and make it less safe? And how can we mitigate those risks in a better way? Um, so I think being on the ground there and, and that experience, uh, as well as sort of all of the research and things that had, I had been sort of aggregating prior to that, has really set us up to create a comprehensive health and safety plan for San Antonio. And I'm also now doing that work for other companies. Um, which is really exciting as I, I, just like everyone else, want to get back to doing what we did um, in the safest way possible. Great. So we've been attacking that uh, sort of from two uh, different but re very related angles. Mm -hmm. One is creating a really comprehensive health and safety guide for our artists and staff who will be with us uh, for the rehearsal and performance process. And I think, Dustin, that's something like what, like a 16 page document that covers every possible avenue of Definitely. how to everything. Yeah, everything from rehearsal to how do we get the singers into town to how do we perform on stage safely and, and when do we do all these various steps to, to get it to look like the final product. Great. And it's taken into, you've really done a phenomenal job, not only looking at what procedures have been like at other companies, but listening to what the health and safety guidelines are that are coming in, say, from our musicians with the San Antonio Symphony or what the CDC is recommending, or even though we are not a quote unquote AGMA house, AGMA is the American Guild of Musical Artists, um, where we don't uh, go through union contracts, but we do love to respect and look at what their policies are like. And we're also following some of those guidelines to ensure that our singers and staff stay healthy and safe as well. But there's this whole other element that you've been working on, which is gonna lead us uh, into our next guest joining us, which is the health and safety policies for our audience, which is equally as crucial. So let me go ahead and uh, have our next guest, Rick Frederick, join the conversation. Hello. Hi, hi. Hey, hi. Rick, how you doing? Doing good. So Wait. if you're in San Antonio, and if you've been to the Tobin Center, Rick's face uh, is probably familiar to you. Um, if you haven't, then let me say, uh, much like Dustin is our guru and keeper of the keys on all things uh, communicative in the rehearsal room process, Rick is our guru and keeper of the keys on all things communicative with the Tobin Center. Is that... A lovely way of describing your role, Rick. <laughs> I love the way you describe that role. <laughs> yes, I um, I'm in, a director of engagement for the community and for our residents. So I um, make sure that your experience is an excellent one and that we are well taken care of, um, both our residents and, and the public. Great. So uh, Rick, the Tobin Center has actually been open for quite a while through mm -hmm. the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about um, how the Tobin Center has been operating even to get us up as we look towards our performances in May? Uh, yeah, we started out very cautiously. Um, we basically kind of shut down as soon as it was mandated and we were ramping down just before that in, in March. 
Uh, I can't believe it's already been a year. Right. Um, and then working closely with the city and um, following CDC, we uh, began to slowly open in June um, with just a few events and they were uh, severely limited. We've been uh, mandated that we can operate at half capacity, but we have not gotten that close yet. Mm -hmm. um, we started with uh, just cinema films inside um, so that we could test policies, so that we could test and watch the flow and make sure that we could properly social distance folks and keep the hand sanitizer stocked and provide mm -hmm. the right um, experience for everyone to keep everybody safe. And so we did that through June, slowly adding um, more events and branching out uh, as we, we go. And we were able to start in November with um, our first resident production, which was The Nutcracker. Mm -hmm. And that was with and the ballet, correct? That was with Ballet San Antonio, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And that really marked our holiday season where we were kind of not, not nearly up to normal. We uh, in normal times would be two to two and a half events on average every day. We're the busiest um, performing arts center of our size in the nation, I think. Mm -hmm. um, to to go from that to to this, it's a it's a big shock. But um, uh, yeah, things have been working out uh, quite well, and we had a little bump during the holidays, and we're managed. Um, events in the Carlos Alvarez Studio Theater, as well as the HEB Performance Hall. And uh, we had uh, Art Market that we kept socially distanced um, on Will's Plaza during that time too. So mm -hmm. we've been able to test things and monitor and adjust and shift where we can. We've taken notes from all those experiences and mm -hmm. moved them forward. Um, to now we have the symphony in the hall again, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's been uh, a whole new experience with them, and it's it's worked out quite well. I have it's a interesting question. to see the different crowds come in for mm -hmm. different events, mm -hmm. and how they react to things. So um, that that always comes into play as well. What was your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. My question is, uh, I, I think like everybody wants to know, or at least everyone that's going to come into the theater to do an event. What was like the level of enthusiasm for the audience to want to get back, like to want to come back into the theater and beat like were the people that were there, you know, are you beating people away with a stick because there's a thousand people that want to come or <laughs> and but well, like the people that are there, you must have, I don't know, a survey or, you know, are you walking around yourself and, you know, distantly, you know, asking people how you they're know, feeling? What is that yeah. level of enthusiasm? There is a lot of that. Um, there yeah. is a, more of an opportunity to talk to more people since we're right. so severely reduced. Usually, mm -hmm. you know, 1,792 people can fit in the HEB hall. So we're mandated we could put in 700, but we've been averaging no more than 500 um, because we mm -hmm. feel comfortable that we can keep everybody safe in that way and we don't mm -hmm. want to go beyond that scope. But it does afford you the opportunity to have a lot of conversations. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, enthusiasm. And I mean, it's. I think it's people are doing it. They feel it's normal. It's fun to get back to. But then when you're sitting in the house and listening to Agarita or San Antonio Symphony mm -hmm. or, um, you know, to a, a rock concert, it suddenly hits you that how much you've missed the arts. And so I've, I've been noticing sort of a dazed, glazed eye, teary kind of <laughs> look. The enthusiasm is there and you can't believe that you had missed it for so long. And, and the significance of live performance just hits you when you're here. Um, yeah. So we're uh, we're headed back at Opera San Antonio into live performance with a semi-staged concert of Lucia de Lammermoor on May 6th and 8th. And in order to do that safely, uh, you know, as I said earlier, we made Dustin our health and safety coordinator. And one of the folks that he's been liaisoning with most in order to be able to have us 
successfully returned to performance is you, Rick. I know you guys have done a lot of work uh, to help communicate back and forth between our organization and yours, what those audience policies should be. And I think it's important uh, for our patrons to know the work that we're doing and the efforts that we're making to mm -hmm. make a return to the Tobin Center, not only a health uh, and say a healthy and safe experience, but also a, a really fun one uh, because you can feel secure walking back through the doors. So I'd love to um, have both of you touch base a little bit on the kinds of policies uh, that you've been working on in order to ensure this kind of security. Uh, Rick, what can you tell us about uh, uh, parking and even just starting at the very beginning, what it's like to arrive at the Tobin Center these days? Well, overall, what we've done is made as many of the processes or the um, uh, paths to the Tobin through your experience at the Tobin to be touchless. Um, so we have prepaid parking passes for our garage. Um, there's reserved parking available um, if you wanted to get closer. Um, the uh, we have information displayed when you come in uh, to, to what to expect. Um, but you also have uh, the unfortunate part is that we've suspended valet parking. Um, but we have done everything that we can to, to make that payment process touchless. Um, and uh, you're able to uh, smoothly transition into the building. And that starts with parking. Fabulous. That's outstanding. Um, so, um, just just to give everyone the information that our tickets for the Lucia are going on sale on Monday, you'll be able to access our website with all of these health and safety measures written out, and you, of course, will be able to purchase, and please do purchase your tickets there. Um, mm -hmm. We've got the section with the audience frequently asked questions. We've got a document for that, uh, and you'll be able to find out all the information that you need to know regarding parking, health screening, building entry tickets, of course, mandatory masks, physical distancing, hand sanitizer, signage we definitely will have to help you there, program books and seating, of course, uh, sanitization that we're doing with the restrooms, the bar and drinking services and intermission, any, any other questions that you have there. Post-show, there will also be a question and answer. Uh, and of course, uh, staff and artist testing protocols will all be there so that we all feel safe uh, and that you can get all those informations and ask us any questions that you want uh, once you've seen everything on the website. So let's break it down a little bit more here for today, because I'm super interested in giving our audience uh, the chance to see and hear information about all of our measures in as many places as possible. So mm -hmm. in addition to the information that uh, Francesco just said will be included on our website starting Monday, once you've parked your car, Rick, and you're headed towards the, the building, what's the health screening process like at the Tobin? Well, once you park your car, you have the option of um, taking the shuttle, which is a golf cart that gets cleaned after each use, or simply walking to the front doors. You can also get dropped off at the front doors if that's something that's more convenient for you. When you get to the front door on the Valero Plaza, um, we will have tents, and you'll see that under the tents, there's a table with one of our event staff, and they have a uh, temperature um, touchless uh, device. It's a proximity thermometer and they are scanning temperatures of every guest that come into the building. If you have a temperature that reads above 104, you will not be allowed in the building, but we will be able to reimburse your uh, the cost of your ticket. Once you get scanned, um, you will walk through a metal detector uh, place your uh, purse, if you have one, onto a table so that the event staff can um, look into the purse to um, do a touchless search and then you will uh, be able to pick up your own package with or uh, bag and then move towards ticketing and at ticketing it's also touchless so if you've gotten your ticket uh, through email and you've printed it at home or you have it on your phone you'll simply present it to a volunteer who will be behind plexiglass and they will scan your ticket at that point and at which point they'll let you into the building and you'll be escorted to your seat where at the um, uh, the ticketing check-in, there's going to be hand sanitizer available for you. And throughout the building, there is automated hand sanitizer and pumps available. 
Um, the great thing about the Tobin is that our seating is adjustable. So we were able to physically remove uh, every other row in the hall. And um, your seating is going to be six feet away front to back. But then also when you get your ticket assignment, you're going to be with your group with two seats between you. So everyone is socially distanced in the hall. Great. So I want to take a, a minute to let Dustin weigh in on uh, the next two things that we're about to talk about. Um, you know, I know, Rick, you've worked really hard at the Tobin Center to make sure that our patrons have markers on the ground that keep six foot yep. distance spacing upon entry or in concession lines or headed to the restroom, which is phenomenal. There's also masking which uh, at Opera San Antonio, we're making mandatory and it is part of two different things. Dustin, tell us a little bit about the masked world for our staff, uh, because it's, it's a little different than what we're doing with our audience. Sure, so all of our staff in backstage areas will be masked, um, with the exception being that our cast of seven singers, uh, when they go on stage, we want to see their faces and also uh, hear their, their beautiful instruments. And so we have uh, set up stations backstage where the singers who are wearing disposable masks can remove their mask and uh, drop it in a waste bin right before they go on stage. And while on stage, there's increased distancing guidelines uh, that, uh, as Laura mentioned before, AGMA has put out a recommendation of six feet of distance to the sides and back and 15 feet from mouth to next person. Um, this is to ensure that, that we keep some additional distance there and, and, and don't spread anything. So we've taken steps to ensure that the audience will also be at least 15 feet away from the singers at all times as they will be unmasked. Uh, and then once the singer is done on stage, as they exit at that same station, there are clean masks and hand sanitizer so they can put one on as they enter into the backstage area where there are other people working. And Francesco, I know you and I are super looking forward to two things. We're gonna be basically triple masked with staff in rehearsal. We do a surgical mask uh, or a KN95 mask, and uh, I'll probably have a cloth mask on as well. Yep. And we've got visors, plastic visors, to ensure that we're staying uh, as safe and non-spreading as possible. Mm -hmm. Our singers will also be masked up through the entire rehearsal process as well. Mm -hmm. And tested, which I think is really important for folks to hear. We're going through a rigorous uh, weekly test process um, that actually will start before artists even begin to arrive to ensure that we're keeping artists and staff as safe as possible and also ensuring that our artists are tested just prior to the start of the process while we'll be removing masks so mm -hmm. that we're ensuring maximum safety not only for uh, our artists and staff but also for the audience as well. Mm -hmm. Which leads me back to audience masking uh, policies. I know every house is a little bit different, but due to the fact that opera is really a, a unique art form um, with uh, even in this reduced capacity, it's still a lot of different kinds of artists on stage. We at Opera San Antonio will be requiring that uh, all audience members uh, remain in their seats and keep their masks on at all times. And that's as much for patron safety uh, as it is for the safety of our artists. We want everybody to have a really enjoyable experience um, and to keep each other as healthy as possible. Is that a fair way of saying that, uh, Rick? <laughs> yes, it is. And, you know, I think it's interesting that in the experience that we've had before, because Ballet uh, San Antonio has um, the dancers performed masked um, and they ask that the audience do the same, uh, keep their masks on in the seats and Symphony is doing it. And um, it doesn't seem to be uncomfortable or inhibit the experience, really. I think Wonderful. people are finding that it is perfectly fine to do so. Yeah. Great. So we've talked a little bit about um, physical distancing within the Tobin itself. Hand sanitizer mm -hmm. will be a plenty and available for all. <laughs> um, there's also some things that are changing like programs, um, which I know we've had some conversations about and we'll be going digital for this experience as opposed to paper programs. Uh, Rick, what's that process been like or how have audiences responded to that so far? Um, I think that we it was bumpy in the beginning, but once people got used to it, it is really 
kind of a nice experience. Um, you're not handing anything over to anyone. So it's part of the whole touchless experience. So you don't have to worry about that transfer. But what we do have is signage throughout the built. We have kiosks with a QR code where the guests can scan that the QR code and have access to the program. And I believe you're sending something out ahead of time so that guests can print up their own copy if they would prefer not to have their phone out during a performance. Um, and that's, I think, been working really well. What we have also done is given each volunteer and all of our patron service managers a copy of your QR code. So if any point along the way, if you didn't get it beforehand, if you don't get it when your ticket's scanned or when you're in the lobby, um, you can always grab a volunteer and they will have the QR code that they can hold up for you to scan. Great. Okay. So we will not, for this particular production, be having an intermission. Um, we'll only do a, basically a one act, the 90 minutes uh, or less performance. But that doesn't mean that uh, there is no fun to be had in terms of concession service. And I know we've talked a little bit about physical distancing, but what can audiences anticipate at this kind of performance? We've been finding that the lines have been working pretty well. We keep them distanced and it doesn't back up. One of the helps here is we have the Noble app, which you can have access to beforehand. You have the opportunity, uh, if you're in the box, uh, your drinks and, and your food can be, you can or actually order food and it will be brought to, to your box. But if you're in the orchestra or anywhere else in the building, you do have the opportunity to order a light snack or a beverage and pick it up at the main lobby bar. And that's been helping keeping um, lines to a minimum. But if you do go into a line, it's usually it moves pretty quickly. Uh, you have a plexiglass barrier between you and the bartender and um, we've been doing touchless payments so that you're handling your own card and that's been working out really well. Wonderful. So a couple of the things we've been working on to make sure that our guests can have as uh, full an evening as possible, even though we're operating under new circumstances, is looking at ways to do a pre-recorded pre-show lecture that can be part of the experience. But we're also working on a way to have a post-show Q&A, which is actually not something that Opera San Antonio has done before. So I'm sort of excited about this. Um, Francesco and I will help lead a conversation with our seven artists uh, at the end of the performance, once they've had a chance to get out of wig, makeup, and costume. And we're developing systems right now to be able to allow patrons to either stay in their box seats or in their seats in other general seated areas so that you can have a little more one-on-one -on -one time with our cast and learn a little bit more about their extraordinary experience uh, as singers and of course during this particular production of Lucia. So we hope that patrons will continue to join us uh, for a post-show activity like that, which is something I'm really excited to share given the fact that um, it allows us to have a more intimate setting with singers, despite the fact that we're in an age where gathering is quite difficult. We can really take advantage of the spacing that we have at the Tobin. So yay, Rick, thank you for helping make that possible for us. Oh, it's been a pleasure. It's been an interesting journey. Um, but you do mention gathering, and ultimately that's what we have in the forefront of our minds, is that we are opening the lobby doors with the house doors a full hour ahead. So that sort of gives you the room to have concessions, use the restrooms, without getting too much um, bulk or uh, gathering points. So you're not getting clusters of people, and you can comfortably move to your seat and still remain distanced. We have reduced the capacity to the restrooms, and we have monitors available that just give a count so that we're, you are not getting crowded, there aren't lines building up in closed spaces. Um, we have continuous cleaning throughout the event. Um, so our restrooms are cleaned and wiped down uh, every 15 minutes. And we try to hit every touch point in the building at least every 30 minutes, if not more. Um, and the air is constantly being cleaned. So we have new filtration systems in place and we are changing those on a regular basis to really amp up our cleaning process. And by May, we might have a new system 
all together in place because we're trying to keep up with the best practices in the nation and the world and provide that level of service for and comfort for our, our guests. That's actually also super important, Rick. Keeping up with best practices is what we yeah. have in mind for our artists, our staff, and our audience. That's a great way of saying that. We're in a time right now where you just really can't afford to be done. So we're right. always researching. We're always looking at the next thing. And we're always watching and, and staying aware of, well, like with Dustin's work, you have to watch and keep your eye on it. And you can't really relax. Otherwise, the, this privilege that we have, this moment of opening is is a privilege. And it's special. And we're one of the few people in the nation or in the country, in the world who are, are able to, to do it. And so we take that very seriously and we want to protect that and protect everyone involved. Fabulous. I do have something that I want to say. And, and I, I, just because I want to acknowledge Dustin and of course, and, and Lauren and Rick, but, but also everybody at the San Antonio symphony, Sarah and everyone that's helped us helped us over there. For those of you that don't know, I mean, for those of you that have seen the San Antonio Symphony perform live, you'll see that they are distanced across the stage. But to do all of that, get the right numbers, get the right distances, and and Dustin being super patient with me for orchestra map drawing over and over and over <laughs> again to try to figure out how best to keep everybody safe um, and how best to keep the players on stage safe. Uh, while we're trying to create that show in front of them. And it, it's it's going to be a, a different experience with the orchestra on stage and the singers all the way downstage. But it, for me, what we've created and what we've done and what we've been able to do and at the extreme level of safety and care that Dustin and Sarah and everyone have been able to do, I have to say uh, a huge thank you. And I'm looking forward to to walking on that stage, uh, you know, and feeling as safe as I could possibly be anywhere. Thanks to all the work that all of you have done. And I look forward to being down there with my colleagues and everyone on stage, but, but Dustin and, and Sarah and everyone else, uh, really, I just, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of that. So I just yeah. want everyone to know that I think it's important that, that we're doing the best we can for everyone on stage, backstage and, and in the house. I think it's, it's just been a wonderful, huge piece of work for you. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a really collaborative process uh, with everyone in San Antonio. So the symphony and, and Rick's whole team to really make sure that uh, the entire experience for everyone involved, right? Everyone on stage, backstage, and uh, you in the audience will have a, a great experience and, and get to see some opera. Mm. Fantastic. Well, my hat definitely goes off to Rick and Dustin, who are just going to be so crucial to us being successful. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely want to thank Dustin and Rick for being absolutely extraordinary guests with us today. So a reminder to everyone who's watching that starting on Monday, you will be able to find all of the health and safety information that we've covered today in this program on our website. Our tickets will also go on sale for Lucia starting on Monday. We're so excited. So we hope uh, hope and pray and truly believe that we're gonna have a wonderful experience and that you will join us for a performance this spring on either May 6th or 8th. And in the meantime, I would highly encourage you to go find more information on our fabulous artists and on Lucia itself on our website, which is operasa.org. Just to say that again, that is operasa.org. Yay, oh, that's not the banner I want. How about this one? Yay, <laughs> oh, you can even donate. How exciting to our cause. <laughs> but that's where you can find all information, whether it's donation or uh, general information on this particular production. Uh, so, upcoming on this series uh, will be guests who are part of our performance process. It's going to include designers who are working with us on Lucia. It's going to include some of the artists that are working with us on Lucia. And our next Beyond the Production will be on March 19th where we're gonna sit down with this artist who you might know, uh, the conductor of Lucia, which is our very own Francesco Miliotto. So <laughs> I'm excited to get Francesco back 
with us in a little bit of a one-on-one -on -one situation so mm -hmm. that we can have him share his unique perspective, not only on the musical structure of the piece, but also how we plan to bring this particular version to life with our incredible cast and with the San Antonio Symphony this spring. So to all of our viewers, uh, thank you for watching this afternoon. We hope you've enjoyed getting an inside perspective on how we're looking to bring this production to life in a very healthy and safe way. And stay tuned uh, to hear more from our artists as we continue to work towards our production this spring. In the meantime, I wish everyone an absolutely wonderful uh, weekend, and hopefully we will see you all again very soon. Thank you again, Dustin and uh, Rick. We'll see you soon as well. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.